Before you know, we open up again um, with an open house on May 21st. Uh, I don't know the exact hours yet. Uh, and then the regular tour season starts May 22nd. And tours are, public tours are on Saturdays and Sundays at 1, 2, and 3 o'clock on the nose um, through October uh, 30th. All you have to do is show up and we take all your money and you can have a tour uh, and also see uh, here. But the, the tour is excellent and we're actually revamping it based on some more information. Um, in addition to uh, the tour season, of course, we have programs like this. Uh, actually, this spring we have a program every month, so you can come back in less than four weeks. Uh, March 16th, just before St. Patrick's Day, a uh, program called Stitches in Time, Family and Slavery in Mercantile America by Rachel May, uh, centering around quilts and uh, uh, quilt tops, uh, etc., uh, and talking about the uh, relationship to the, as she calls it, the national business of slavery. Uh, Wednesday, actually two programs in April. Uh, on Wednesday, April 6th, um, Dan Kokolek, who is the official historian of Harvard Law School, will be here to talk about uh, the first century of Harvard Law School. And the reason that's relevant is because a great amount of Isaac Royal's money, uh, after he passed away, went to basically found Harvard Law School. What's that day? Uh, that's April 6th, Wednesdays. Programs are always Wednesdays. It's, it's uh, national law here. <laughs> uh, April 20th, uh, something I'm particularly looking forward to, a program about the African Burying Ground Memorial in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which was opened late last year. Uh, fascinating story of rediscovery uh, and uh, uh, memorialization, the whole process involved with the archaeology, the process of how to um, how to design this uh, memorial as, as a living uh, uh, um, a place. Uh, we'll have the uh, head of the uh, project as well as the uh, co-chair, I guess is the right word, from the city of Portsmouth. Um, if you're in Portsmouth, by the way, it's on Chestnut Street, which is a street that runs between the two main streets there. It's a, street, it's a short block long, uh, absolutely amazing uh, uh, project um, in terms of the history of, of slavery in uh, New Hampshire. That's on Wednesday, April 20th. That's also our, our uh, annual meeting. We have the world's shortest uh, annual meeting, I believe, uh, here. So. Um, we also will have our, our fundraiser on June 5th. Our speaker is playwright Kirsten uh, Greenidge, whose play, I'm sorry if the name escapes me, is um, uh, going on now at, at Boston University. We'll have more details about that. We always have an annual fundraiser in uh, early June. Um, if you uh, want more information and you have an email address, we have this fancy new form. Uh, you can fill out so we can a legible email address um, there at the ticket table if you'd like to do that. We do a monthly, uh, very nice monthly e-newsletter. So let me introduce our speakers tonight. Uh, the talk is, is uh, Voices Beyond Bondage, uh, 19th Century Verse by African Americans. Um, there are two fine folks here, uh, Erica DeSimone, right up here in Medford. In fact, I think she told me earlier that she had not been here since sixth grade, which is just a <laughs> um, <laughs> just uh, She got her undergraduate degree out in Westfield. You know what Westfield's motto is? It's Quip City. Uh, she currently works at the Modern Language Association. Uh, you've been in more than 10 years, okay. Yeah, uh, I Fidel actually Luis, left uh, a year ago, but yes. Oh yeah, okay, okay, well, we're, we're a little behind. Um, uh, Fidel Luis uh, earned bachelor's and master's from NYU. Uh, he uh, uh, does a lot of writing uh, and editing. Uh, he's a, a New York State court interpreter and works as a uh, business uh, consultant. And together they will be um, doing some reading, some explanation, etc. from this very a fascinating book on Voices Beyond Bondage. Thank you. Thank you. Is that light okay? The light is fine, yes, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Off to an amazing start, folks. <laughs> <laughs> My pen. My pen, my pen, my joy and my pride, my idol I worship each day. 
A gem which adversity giveth to me shall speak of the shackles of the bond and the free, and sound thy loud anthems over woodland and lie to echo forever and I. My pen, my pen, thou hope of my youth, what visions I saw in thy name. My castles have fallen, alas, I am left, from friends and from kindred and almost bereft. I feel the cold pinions around me are pressed that could stifle my infant-like frame. My pen, my pen, I wish not for thee to leave me a gainer of gold. No motives more pure, I trust now in part. A halo of love still nearer my heart shall shine with more brilliance when lucre and art are with past ages enrolled. My pen, my pen, thou noblest of arms, thou grand worthy scribe of the world. Tis not for thy name, but thy valueless worth that make thee the dearest of treasures on earth and calls for loud praises round each peasant's hearth where beauty so clearly unfurled. My pen, my pen, there is joy in thy name. My heart shall forever be thine own. While Washington's banner around us shall wave, O oh, stretch forth thy hand like an angel to save from deep tears of anguish a free country slave that the stain be forever unknown. My pen, my pen, when I leave this dark sphere and pass to another more blessed, tis now my fond wish that I may be engaged in recording some virtue of thee who hast in thy might caused the slave to stand free and at last reach a haven of rest. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, especially on this rainy, rainy night. Um, as Lincoln mentioned, I am a Medford native and, in fact, grew up very literally down the street and around the corner from the Royal House. Um, so I'm, it's a little surreal for me to be here tonight, but I'm very privileged to be with you. The preceding poem was written by Frank Addison Mowig Filam of Kansas and was published in the Frederick Douglass newspaper in February of 1852. Filam was a slave from Kansas who purchased manumission from his master. Sometime around 1850, he moved to New upstate New York and began his life as a free man in a free state. We begin this evening with Philam's moving celebration of reading and writing, because this poem speaks to the very heart of Voices Beyond Bondage. <clears throat> when Philam venerates his pen, he is not merely expressing his own appreciation for literacy and writing, he is giving us a glimpse of the esteem that many African Americans held for art, literature, and the power of the circulated word. Although history likes to tell us, through omission or otherwise, that African Americans were uneducated and illiterate, literacy was in fact esteemed and celebrated in many African American communities. We know this because free African Americans taught, fought tooth and nail to establish schools for their children. Because despite laws prohibiting slaves from reading and or writing, so, but <clears throat> reading and or writing, over 10% of slaves, that's some 400,000 people had achieved literacy by the close of the Civil War. We know this because African American churches throughout the nation taught reading and writing furtively, if necessary, to both adults and children. And we know this because African Americans 
harnessed the power of the written word. They used newspapers, poetry, newsletters, and pamphlets to strengthen their communities, share their ideas, and affect change. Voices Beyond Bondage is the first anthology to focus on the poetry of the 19th century's Black-owned press. We've taken 150 poems from 36 Black-owned newspapers and compiled them into one volume. Over 125 authors are represented. Their, their works span the years 1827 through 1899. So why do we begin in 1827? Because 1827 was the year that three clergymen in New York City founded Freedom's Journal, the country's first black owned and operated newspaper. This made 1827 a landmark year in American history, although the history books had failed to record it as such. Now, Freedom's Journal was groundbreaking for many reasons beyond being the country's first Black-owned newspaper. The quality of the journalism, for one thing, was outstanding. That the paper refused to run ads that were socially demeaning to people of color, and in the process spurned the revenue from those ads, is another. That this fledgling left of the left radical newspaper operating on a shoestring budget could stay afloat for over two years only adds to the journal's laurels. Now, as you might imagine, the advent of Freedom's Journal unleashed a torrent of journalistic and social issues. But what Fidel and I found most fascinating about the newspaper is this. Freedom's Journal had just four pages per week to address the entire scope of African American news in New York City. And yet the editors chose to reserve a full column in each issue for readership sponsored poetry. Now we know that poetry was extremely popular in the 19th century. Most mainstream newspapers did carry a poetry column. These columns were popular and drove sales. But we have to remember that with few exceptions, these newspapers were written exclusively for Caucasian audiences. African Americans did, were not included in the intended audience of these newspapers and certainly people of color did not see themselves reflected therein. And this, of course, extended to the poetry along with anything, everything else. But the, journal's, but the journal's column was different. <clears throat> the editors didn't include the column with an eye towards circulation but specifically so that African Americans would have a creative space all their own, a media space in which to share their works and publish them. The poetry column of Freedom's Journal saw the first everyday outlet for <clears throat> first outlet for everyday African Americans who were writing, something which literally did not exist anywhere else on the planet. Now there are instances of authors of color having published poetry prior to Freedom's Journal, but these are exceedingly rare. Publishing in early America was very much the domain of an elite few, reserved for named authors and those who could self-fund publication. While an extremely select few authors of color, such as Phyllis Wheatley, a slave woman here in Boston, had successfully published, this publication was achieved only under the most extraordinary of circumstances. For her, for her part, Wheatley not only had to obtain her master's permission to publish, 
but it was so unthinkable that a black woman could author such intricate, moving poetry that she actually had to defend her authorship in court before anyone would publish her. And even then, she had to travel to London to get her works in print. The preface of her 1773 book, Poems on Various Subjects, contained an attestation from 10 white gentlemen, and I'm using, using that loosely, folks, gentlemen, <laughs> confirming black authorship. So perhaps history would have recorded scores of other early African-American poets, but bereft of an outlet for publication, these works have been lost. The decision of the editors of Freedom's Journal to dedicate an open call poetry column <clears throat> suggests that there were many, many such black writers whose voices have been lost to the passage of time. So now, all of this begs the question, what were African Americans reading and writing about in the 19th century? The short answer, everything under the sun. While popular history likes to tell us that people of color were mostly concerned with slavery, this is not exactly true. <laughs> Certainly slavery was very unfortunately a part of the African American identity. <clears throat> But bondage was by no means the only topic in the hearts and minds of African Americans. Family, love, humor, hope, religion, griefs, grief, politics, God, and morals. All of these and more are found within Voices Beyond Bondage. <clears throat> From the very inception of this project, Fidel and I knew we had the rare opportunity to bring our readers beyond bondage, beyond the misnomer of slavery as sole identity to reveal a much more nuanced, accurate picture of the African-American experience. In order to showcase this fuller scope, we divided voices into five thematic sections. Fidel and I have selected one poem from each theme in the book to share with you tonight. I'm going to ask Fidel to come up here and introduce each section to you, and I'll be back to read the representative poems. This is Fidel. Not to be confused with Castro, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Lewis, not Castro. But in any event, um, I'm very happy to be here, um, especially in this house, uh, because it's a historical. Uh, uh, it is a. It, 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 this is history. Yeah, 19th century, 18th century. They're all kind of uh, related, and uh, so. For some reason or another, I feel like I'm home. <laughs> uh, not as a slave, but I'm home. <laughs> the, um, the first theme, um, let, you, you, you heard Erika go uh, over the, uh, the presentation, and I'm going to read the five sections that we have in this book, but let me just say very quickly that um, there are two people in the audience who have, who contributed extensively to this book. Mm -hmm. They really did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's Michael D. Simon. Please stand up, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Take any credit, but he was the historical no, consultant for this book, and he made sure I didn't screw anything up. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, we were working on this project, and uh, the 
we gathered the poems, the, you know, we, we did uh, a lot of, many, many years of research, but we wanted to put the book in perspective. In other words, we wanted to make sure that every historical reference is exact. And every poem kind of reflect the, the era. <laughs> and I would say that uh, throughout the <clears throat> years, uh, Michael was, uh, I mean, he, for me, <laughs> he, uh, he offered intellectual debates all the time. <laughs> um, you know, he's a, he's a very great historian um, and, um, you know, very grateful for his contribution to the book, and to put it this in a good perspective. And the second person who is here, because you know, when we were going, we were going to press, she helped us from day one to the day the book was published. She helped us in many ways, and I'm very grateful. Um, this is Kovolichi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, Daddy. Daddy, 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 I don't Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now we're going to move on. So uh, let's move on with the uh, uh, with the with the agenda. Um,